Hey, 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 everybody. Today we're talking Shazam, Fury of the Gods. Hey, everybody, and welcome back to BK's Bullets. As always, I'm your host, Brent Casina. Yes, we're on travel again, and just like you, I did not go see Shazam! Fury of the Gods over the weekend. I waited until Monday, and I'm kind of, I don't know about glad I did. Um, basically, the word on the street about this movie, I think, is a little bit right. Now, I loved the first Shazam! film. I believe it was from 2019. Really big fan of that film. Lots of humor, lots of heart. Unfortunately, Shazam! Fury of the Gods... I really feel like the problem with it is that it's trying so hard. It is trying so hard to be fun, trying so hard to be funny, trying so hard to be cool. Uh, all of that on a budget with a story that really doesn't kind of make any sense. It's not based on any cohesive or famous Shazam story. And I was kind of going into the film, watching all these trailers for like Ninja Turtles and Into the Spider Across the Spider Verse. Uh, what else was there? And I was thinking like, hey, at least this this movie's got an original story. Well, you know, thinking that it was going to be a good thing because the last Shazam film was based on the uh, New 52 run. Not a really run, the backup, so to speak. The graphic novel by Jeff Johns. I guess you could call it a graphic novel. I don't know. It's a trade now. You just go find it there. But it's in the New 52 backups originally. So this isn't based on any story in particular this is just a continuation of that universe, that tale. And um, it just kind of suffers. It just suffers from too many characters. It suffers from too much going on. It suffers from trying too hard. It suffers from the story not being that interesting. Uh, it just suffers. Like, it's not, a, it's not an entertaining movie, like, that's so bad that it's entertaining. Like... I watched Black Adam, and everybody was kind of like, Black Adam's a mediocre movie. And I had fun watching Black Adam. I was entertained. I was engaged. And, man, watching Fury of the Gods, this new Shazam film, I was looking down at my watch. I was trying to look at my phone. Uh, I was in an Alamo draft house up here in Virginia. So I was like, well, I can't look at my phone because they're going to kick me out, even though there's nobody in the freaking theater. So probably could have. But, man, I had that urge because I was just like, this movie, is not where is it going? Or... When is it going to end? Um, there's so much talk. Like, you really feel the budget in this film. There's so much talking in the middle of the film that there's no, like, action set piece. And then when they do get to their middle act action set piece, you can feel, I don't know, the budget. Like, I normally don't try to complain about, you know, I normally try to champion physical effects over CG but the stuff they were doing here was 90s wire work kind of stuff with slamming characters into walls. And it wasn't like, it just felt really slow uh, because they didn't speed it up or anything like that. Like, I feel like a post-production speed up of all these different actions would have made the characters feel faster and stronger. Uh, and you still could have done it practically instead of, uh, you know, just doing it normal and it feeling like, oh, there goes a woman raised by a cable because there's five men jumping on it at the same time. It's obeying the laws of physics when these characters should have been whipping into each other um, so fast and so strong that they should have had more impact. So because, in this case, because they did it practically, um, they they did not have any, like, oomph to, any, in, to most of those action scenes in the middle of the film that they were trying to keep scaled down because it was a physical punch-punch fight, uh, much less than a, a, a magic fight or anything like that, because that was all saved for the final act of the film. Um, the first movie was strong because it did not play with the DC Universe. Yeah, it mentioned Batman, it mentioned Superman, it had the Batarang in it, and it, it made you feel like it existed in that world, but it didn't try too hard to be a part of that world. And this movie completely 180s from that perspective. This movie lets you know it is in that world up front right away. And it suffers for that. It suffers so hard for that. Um, 
basically because Wonder Woman's in it, right? And and I I did not know Wonder Woman was in it until I read online that oh don't watch the TV spots it gives away Wonder Woman's in it, and I was like okay. And then I was watching the film and I was like oh man this is really bad um, because there's a thing basically Billy has the hots for Wonder Woman as any teenager might do totally understandable. However, instead of being a one liner that they throw away and and never call back to. It's a one-liner that goes and comes back again and again and again, and so much so that it's like the D plot of the film about how much Billy has the hots for Wonder Woman. And they, you know, it would have been, the end of the film might have been amusing had it just been a one-liner that never came back, as opposed to this thing that was hammered over and over and over again. Um, there's a dream sequence with Wonder Woman here that's really awkward. And at first it starts out like, okay, um, I see what you're doing here. You're using a body double just like you had to do with the Man of Steel in the first film. And then we're going to get, I don't even know if we're going to get Gal Gadot's face. And then it turns into something else. Uh, and then Gal Gadot, I don't know if this is a spoiler or not. She shows up at the end of the film as Wonder Woman to no one's surprise after all because they've hammered it so hard. Um for like 30 minutes prior so when she shows up you're not surprised you kind of knew it was coming anyway uh and then they don't use her to any real effect so like you're just like okay yeah she's there what is she doing and it turns out she's doing stuff with the plot of the film that totally erases this the the ending of the movie uh, and, and just feels like haphazardly thrown in or a deus ex machina to, to you know, finish off the film's storyline or whatever. Or not even finish the storyline, but to, to make it possible for there to be a sequel. You know what I mean? I'm trying not to spoil it too much. I don't know if I want to or not, honestly. Because if I spoil it, it would keep you from watching it, I guess. But at the same time, I was... I was reading a, I was at dinner before this film trying to read, you know, online and I was reading a, I opened up a Ringer article that someone had shared about how Wonder Woman performed poorly last weekend at the box office, like two days ago, right? And uh, it spoiled a lot of the movie for me. So I was trying to skip ahead and it just said, uh, keep going, keep going. And I was like, no, motherfucker, don't. Uh, so there was some st other stuff in there that also had spoiled for me. So I don't know if that affected the movie at all, but even watching the movie, like, I was just not involved, not interested, and, man, it tried so hard. And even the stuff I didn't get spoiled on, we're still talking about this movie trying to be part of the DCU so hard. The end credit scene has other characters from um, the, a James Gunn show. I'll just put it at that. And seems to be setting up for another film in the DC universe that is never going to come based on the fact that um, Dwayne Johnson's written off Black Adam, right? And the fact that James Gunn is now the ha the head honcho of DC, and whatever this film's trying to set up is not on his block of films for the next three years or four years, right? So it just... And also, that scene is another scene where it's trying so hard to be funny. Literally, every single character is trying so hard to be funny. The two characters walking in to see uh, Shazam are trying hard to be funny to each other. They suck at it. It's not funny. And then Shazam, Zachary Levi, is trying so hard to be funny when he's talking to them that he also sucks at it. And I think that is what hurt this film the most for me is Zachary Levi's performance. Um, I'm not going to comment on whatever his political views are or his... Um, vaccine views i don't think he's that far removed from most people uh in the world you know maybe a little bit more than me but that's fine you can have your own views and post them on social media or whatever just maybe not but before your movie comes out just fyi because the media is one way or the other right so anyway the problem with him in this film is that he's just trying so hard the things that made him endearing in the first film because there was, I think the first film actually was made better by the fact there was so much of um, Asher, the young man who plays Billy Batson, 
as opposed to like it was an equal balance between Billy Batson as a character and Zachary Levi's Shazam. And this film is way more unbalanced in terms of who's playing who or who's the main character. The main character is the magic hero Shazam played by Zachary Levi and not a balance of the two actors um, playing these basically the same character. You know, the first film never really felt like the Asher kid was the personality he had with Zachary Levi, but you kind of took it because he was experiencing new things and and was more excited about that than his shitty fucking life he had, right? Here, you have a lot more Zachary Levi trying to be exciting, and anytime you see the Asher kid, he's way more endearing and way more serious than Shazam with Zachary Levi ever is. Uh, Zachary Levi is kind of doing a, a Deadpool by way of Shazam impression the whole time. And when Billy Batson is his plain self, he is not that same character. So not only do you have no balance between the two characters in the film in terms of screen time, they're also playing completely different people. So it's, an, and I know, okay, Shazam gets the wisdom of Solomon or whatever, but they make a point in here to kind of say like, hey, um, that's not really the thing you think it is. Um, and they also never, like, I would have liked if they, like, one of the cool parts I thought in this film is that they turned the Rock of Eternity into their lair. However, they made a weird decision to have all of the kids have to be um, their superhero selves when they're in the Rock of Eternity as opposed to their teenager or preteen selves, which I thought was strange because it's it's decorated like a preteen hangout spot. So what, like, what gives? Like, Why can't we use these child actors? I feel like the film would have been a lot better had they actually said, you know what, we're going to save the superhero actors for the superheroing scenes and the child actors for the talking scenes. And it probably would have made it a lot more endearing a la Harry Potter as opposed to whatever we ended up with here, where you have Zachary Levi, Megan Good, um, uh, <clears throat> Seth from the OC in their fucking super suits, talking to the guy from 13 Reasons Why, and DJ Katrona, who looks way too old to be in any of these suits also with Zachary Levi. So it's kind of a weird, weird scenes where they're just talking to each other, and there's, you know, the only one who's actually acting like a little kid is Megan Good, and she is still phenomenal, not just good, phenomenal as Darla here, um, but she's used so little, you know, maybe it's it's uh, it's good that she's not used because you might get tired of her, but she's the only one that really gets it that, hey, I'm supposed to act like that person over there when I'm in this suit, not as whatever I want this character to be. Um, I'm supposed to take my lead from the little kid and the director, as opposed to anything else. And, and Zachary Levi is, is not doing that. <sighs> All right, so what what else about this film doesn't work? I mean, I'm searching for things that do work, and there's not a whole lot that actually works, and that's kind of frustrating, man. Um, the villains, you have Helen Mirren in this film, Lucy Liu, Rachel Zegler as the daughters of Atlas. Um, they're throwaway villains. I mean, like, I've never heard of the Daughters of Atlas before in the comic books. If they do exist, I would be surprised. I feel like they're made up entirely for this movie. And that's not a great, that's not a bad thing necessarily. It's not a great thing either because there's nothing to draw from per se. Uh, and I think, you know, I was, th I was saying earlier in the video that I was looking forward to a wholly original story. And the just, I'm, I'm still not opposed to original stories in, in comic book movies, but they got to be good stories. They got to be good stories. And what they turned in what they turned in here was not a good story at all. I mean, you have at one point at the beginning of the film all but all the villains are totally villainous. They they have a common goal and they're going after it. And then partway through the film they've accomplished half of their goal and then all of a sudden you have um two of the three villain characters turning around on each other disagreeing with each other what their common stated goal was that they've been planning for the last i don't know six thousand years or however long this has been happening and it's just like 
wait, why are they turning on each other all of a sudden? Because one person had a conversation? I'm sorry. If you can't convince a Democrat these days that so-and-so is bad, or if you can't convince a Republican these days that Trump is bad, then you cannot convince me that these gods would be thinking about this plan for thousands of years and would all of a sudden turn on a dime because one conversation or one interaction. Like, just it. In today's climate, it just doesn't make sense because people are so entrenched in their views rather than using reason or logic that I'm, I'm, maybe this is my faith in humanity that's disappearing, that I just don't believe that people or gods would use reason and logic these days because it seems like no one else does. Um, so that's, that's kind of weird things that happen too. Um, the Skittles stuff, I like Skittles. I'm a fan of Skittles. Um, I didn't feel like it was too egregious here. You know, is it more egregious than... Uh, fucking Reese's Pieces in E.T.? I don't think so. It's not great either. Uh, none of it did really feels smart in that way. Um, so it is kind of bad, I guess. So, I don't know. I will say, there were, the one good thing about this film is that most of the effects look pretty good. Um, all the creature work looks really good. And you have the dragon, you have a chimera, you have a cyclops minotaur unicorns all of that like the creature work look work looks pretty good you're never like ah oh, that doesn't look that real it lo looks really good and i said the same thing about black adam too like the effects in black adam were standout like compared to the marvel stuff which are these massive budget movies and i'm wondering now if these marvel boot movies are a massive budget because they've paid these stars to film so many different parts that their contracts continuously expand to take up most of that budget uh i mean to, if you were to tell me that ant-man and quantum mania was 200 million dollars i would have laughed you in the face and be like there's no way that any of those actors are worth 200 million bucks and maybe because there's so many of those actors in that film that it is uh you know and your the leftovers are for the effects budget and that's why the effects kind of sucked in that film i can't quite say the same thing about this film because most of your actors here are not big name, so to speak. I mean, Mil Helen Mirren has some recognition, but I don't know that she's pulling down, uh, you know, the paychecks that Robert Downey Jr. was pulling down in Avengers, you know what I mean? So, I don't think there's any of that. Um, the other weird thing about this film is that I feel like David F. Sandberg, who returns from the first film to direct this one, I don't know, it doesn't, it doesn't feel the same. Like I, like I said, I feel like the story and the tying into the DCEU, which is now that we know is dead, just feels worthless. Um, just hampers this film in a way that's not recoverable. Maybe in a few years, this film might be a decent watch, but today, it's just not. It's just not. And I don't know that there's anything salvageable about this film, and that's that's a big bummer to me. Um, I really did feel like I wasted two hours in the theater tonight. And, and that's a bummer because I was looking forward to this film. I'm such a fan of the first one, but it lost the heart. It lost the whimsy. It lost the lightning. It lost the crackle. And it lost the surprises, whatever surprises it had with Wonder Woman and all that stuff got lost because of WB's marketing greed, wanting to advertise this stuff, thinking it would make you go see the film. No, if the film was good, it would made people go see the film. But because this thing had reviews that were half and half, like, nobody went. Make good films, guys. Make good films. Rule number one. I feel like the next Marvel movie, if it comes out, like, Quantumania, you know, in terms of reviews, that, like, I really do feel like the tide of superhero films is turning. Just in terms of the quality, because we've had a bunch of ones that were pretty good, some stinkers, but... Most of the ones that have come out, at least from Marvel anyway, have been, you know, not top tier, but middle of the road. But there's so many of them that you're like, well, yeah, okay. We're building to something. I get it. We're going to Infinity War, the end game. Okay, cool. You know, it wasn't that terrible. Uh, but now that we're not really, there's no end game in sight, per se, with the Marvel films, at least. And you have all this fucking television content that's clogging the pipes. Just the qual the quality of them is... I don't know if it's suffering more or maybe it's more noticeable. Maybe that's it. 
So because you have Marvel suffering, you're also seeing the suffering of all these other films because you're comparing them to everything else, right? Uh, and DC, if they're just, if these next couple of films are just like this, nobody's going to be excited to see the next phase. Like Aquaman was a banger. That first Aquaman film, fantastic. Love that film. Shazam, love that film. But Shazam 2, no way, man. No way, Jose. And Aquaman 2, by, by some reports, is just as bad. And that sucks. So I hope The Flash is good. By all reports, of course, they're only putting out the good ones. It's supposed to be pretty good. Haven't heard shit about Blue Beetle much other than the set picks. We haven't seen a trailer for that yet. You know, that's supposed to come out in August. And these are the last gasps of the DCEU, DCEU or whatever, before the Gunverse begins in 2025. So I really do feel like if these films suffer at the box office, like there's no way you're going to convince a bunch of people to go back in 2025 to see the next, the newest phase in the DCEU because they're just going to be like, well, hey, remember those films from two years ago? It was fucking blue, so why am I going to waste my time? Everything other than the Batman sucked, so why am I going to waste my time with your new Superman film, James Gunn? They got a lot to prove, and uh, they got to get the quality of these films up somehow. But I don't know if that's going to happen because apparently WB Discovery, Warner Discovery is suffering with with money problems right now, so I don't know. I, this film is not worth your time. Wait for it to come on HBO Max, honestly. Just wait. Thank me later. Don't waste your money. And and that sucks to say, because I was looking forward to this one because I love the first one so much. So there's my verdict. Let me know, guys, what you thought of Shazam, if you did actually go see it. And uh, I'll see you guys next time in the funny pages.